to our webinar on uh, managing quality in China. Um, I'm really excited to have Jim Twerdall with us today. Jim is uh, a strategy and marketing expert, um, and he's also an expert in uh, managing quality in China. He has a company that's focused just on this, on this topic, and it's certainly a timely topic today as we have, um, <laughs> Well, all sorts of disruptions happening in our supply chain with coronavirus, et cetera. So I'm sure everybody will be um, very intrigued to hear. So uh, we're really excited to have uh, Jim with us today uh, to talk about this topic. And, uh, and we're glad you're joining us as part of uh, Apex Inland Empire. And so with that said, we'll get, uh, we'll get started. So Jim, <laughs> uh, could yes, you- Yes, Lisa, tell great, us great to be here. Well, thank you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, well, let's just start at the high level and maybe talk a little bit about uh, managing quality in China and like not even all that's going on today, but why would you want to put some additional efforts towards managing quality in China? Uh, you know, managing quality in China is really a, an extension of the way that they have done business really since sourcing shifted, you know, to South Asia from Japan and then to Korea and then Taiwan and then finally to China beginning about 20 years ago. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Chinese companies just don't have an ingrained culture of quality. It's always been about getting the product out the door just as fast as they can so they can get paid. And so the monitoring quality in China has become uh, really important uh, because of the, the inherent costs involved in, in really poor quality, you know, poor quality control leads to, to uh, not only additional costs, but uh, decline in brand reputation and all sorts of other things. Oops, unfortunately, I've lost your audio. Oh, yes, I'm here. Sorry. I did mute myself so you wouldn't have distracting uh, background noise. So uh, I, you're absolutely right, uh, you know, as far as when you're dependent on um, anywhere, really, um, that you can't see and touch directly, there's certainly something to be said about making sure that you don't, that you know about quality proactively instead of waiting until you actually receive the product to find out. Is that uh, <laughs> Yeah, there, there are many, there, there, there are actually several steps to the process. I mean, the, the first one is in the, the proper selection of vendors. Um, and so that the, the, the vetting of factories in advance is a lot better than just trying to go on Alibaba or something and pick out a few products from suppliers because you'll never know what you, you could get involved in. Um, as, as most people know, the, the respect for intellectual property is not great in China. And that, uh, a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted in this country in terms of manufacturing quality uh, just aren't ingrained there. So one of the things we do when we're helping companies source products there is, is first visit the factories and uh, spend quite a bit of time talking to their management and, and walking around and looking at what they're doing because you can, you can learn a tremendous amount just by observing. You see the other companies they're making products for, you often can pick up on whether or not they are, are uh, counterfeiting something or, or doing some other kind of shady practices. Uh, you can also get first-hand knowledge of the kind of quality control procedures they already have. I mean, we've gone to factories where there's no incoming inspection or they, they get incoming parts and they're stored in dusty, dirty, sunny environments, all sorts of you know, kinds of strange things can happen. And then they, they, while you're there to start begin monitoring what their in-process quality control procedures are. So most Chinese factories, even, even the smaller ones, have some kind of quality control procedures, but they're often not documented, they're often not rigorously enforced, and uh, you know, again, it's, it's kind of whatever it takes to get the product out the door so they can get paid. Um, so the, the video's changed again. I'm not sure that that's... Uh, Oh, I, I did that on purpose. I wanted to make you the spotlight since you were. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I give you some examples of things that can happen. You can go to China and have them produce a sample product that will be perfect and meet all of your requirements and specifications. But then when they go to put it into production, all of a sudden some of the component parts change because they found a less expensive source to substitute 
where the, the uh, quality may not be at all the same as what you originally contracted for. So it's, it's really important to be able to monitor it every step of the way. Well, that's a really good point, uh, Jim. Do you find that, I mean, in the U.S., we would, we would expect that folks would tell us this up front, but my understanding is, is that that by no means is an assumption um, when you're dealing in China. It, yeah. it, it really is an assumption. Now, th there are some bigger, more sophisticated factories like Foxconn that produces Apple iPhones and so on, where they're going to have a lot of those processes in place and they're going to be ISO certified and so on. But the vast majority of factories don't. And they're very small entrepreneurial businesses, um, often underfinanced and, and uh, you know, they may be controlled by the government. Uh, and, and at least there's lots of government regulation that, that comes along. They may also have some corrupt staff because they've had to bribe some city official to get a, a, a permit to operate. And so it's, it's just not the same as doing business here. Yeah, very, so making, making assumptions in China, um, from my understanding anyway, can be a very, can have very serious consequences. So I think that's a large part of why you, uh, how did you get into like being in the managing quality in China business? And, you know, it seems like that's probably one of the compelling reasons is, is my um, guess. Yeah, yeah, very definitely. And it's, it's important to have people there you know, with, with feet on the ground to see what's going on. And as they do quality control inspections, which are, are for the most part, sampling inspections, you know, um, to document what you find and create CAPAs, corrective action plans, so that the factories are required to take action so that they can't have these same recurring quality issues. Yeah, and actually, by the way, uh, for the folks on the webinar, uh, we have you on mute uh, so that we don't have a lot of background noise, but we are definitely open to receiving questions. So you can submit them through the Q&A box or the chat box, and I will make sure I bring them up to uh, Jim to answer. So, uh, so Jim, uh, uh, since we were talking about, um, you know, the basic process of managing quality in China, uh, what are... Uh, some of the checks that you end up putting in place um, uh, if you if you do this the right way. You know, it sounds like well, you have the, to have more involved. The, the first step is to have very good quality control criteria that you have shared with the factory and gotten communal buy-off on. So to have very detailed specifications for each product and methods of measuring what the quality is. Now, in, in some cases, you would say that they're subjective measures but most of the time you can come up with some kind of uh, a standard that they have to, to conform to. Uh, even things like, a, uh, like color, for example, um, you may have specified a PMS color for the side of some part and it can vary quite a bit. Well, one way of, of dealing with that is to give samples of things that clearly meet the standard and then some that, that clearly don't meet it on both sides of that standard and require them always to have uh, a finished product be within that window that you've created. And you can do that with lots of other things as well. Uh, another very valuable thing to do is to do a lot of statistical analyses. So when you find a defect of a given kind, make sure you document it and record it and start tallying them so you can start to see trends between different production runs. The, the more analysis you do, the easier it is to talk to your, your suppliers about the things that, that they need to correct. Interesting, I hadn't thought of that. So, uh, so you're saying we, you know, make them keep track of certain data. I mean, it makes sense, but make them keep track of certain data and keep on top of it on a daily basis or weekly basis or? Yeah. Well, with each production run, I mean, like, uh, the vast majority of, of factories in China are producing a wide variety of products often on the same production line. So the, there are very few companies that have large enough production runs to keep a line running the same product all the time. So they're constantly changing over. So you really need to have standards that apply to your product and to, to gather data about it. So when they set up the line for the next time, that whatever the problems they were incurring it can, can be uh, focused on. So with each production run, so you really have to, it sounds to me like you're really talking about proactively manage, managing this as if you were producing it. 
really. Uh, Absolutely, you have to pro proactively manage it. And, um, you know, it, it, is, it has gotten even increasingly more difficult because of the cost pressures. When the, when the tariffs were imposed on Chinese companies, many um, of their export customers pushed back and said, even though it's our government that opposed these tariffs, we're not accepting a cost in from you or not we're not accepting the full 25% or whatever the number was and so it put increased pressure on them to, to cut costs and to to move things through very quickly so just the imposition of tariffs had created more quality problems we're now going to have another rash of quality problems because of the coronavirus mm -hmm. because factories uh, as of I just got a report yesterday or the day before that factories in most of the manufacturing sectors in China are at only at about 50% of capacity or of, or of normal production rate today. And, uh, and, and the rates of drayage, you know, the movement of goods to the ports are even less, like 30% on average. Well, wow. when they come back up to speed, they're gonna be under enormous pressure to make manufacturing deadlines. And even, even those that get good quality control, the quality control standards are probably going to be relaxed some because there's so many customers here, they're in desperate need for product so that they will probably relax a little bit and then have to do a lot more inspection once the product gets here. Wow. I mean, I think that's, a, well, it leads into a definitely a topic of interest. Uh, so I know from talking with an international business attorney uh, who deals, you know, uh, extensively in China, that what they communicate and what they do are two different things. So um, I think that uh, that leads me to uh, thinking that we probably need to emphasize uh, or at least put a lot more focus on this with relation to the coronavirus. I mean, do you have any thoughts about how, what folks should be doing? Because that, I agree, there's some significant risk there. Yeah, they, I, you know, unfortunately, a lot of, of Chinese companies, especially because they don't speak English that well, if you give them an agreement or a contract or a non-disclosure agreement, they'll just, as a matter of course, sign it and, and having no real intention to do what it says. And so that you may catch them at it later and they kind of say, so what? And there are very few remedies. And I think it's starting to change and I think their courts are probably getting better and especially in, in terms of intellectual property, but it's still a far cry. So um, it's, you know, there was an old saying that you, you inspect what you expect. And so having people on the ground that will be in the factory, seeing what's happening, talking to the people and reemphasizing quality is, is really important. I, I always tell all of our clients that when they, and they, you know, typically we'll visit factories once or twice a year, maybe even more, that on every single visit, they have to stress how important quality is to them. Even though they, you know, we kind of take it for granted, it's got to be stressed over and over and over again to try to get it ingrained in their culture. Um, and to the extent you can, have penalties for poor quality. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good point because I really, uh, my understanding, and tell me if you uh, see this happening in your field too, because you're with, you're helping companies manage quality in China, so you should be seeing this uh, if it is true. But I'm understanding that, like you said, uh, when they come under cost pressure, your manufacturers, they may be well intentioned, but if cost pressures change or the, you know, the government, um, I don't know, imposes some additional, I don't know regulations or other changes that they have to make it could it could easily impact the quality because they may swap out um, quality of materials or they might just delay certain pieces or you know something will happen in the background that may that'll definitely change the quality of the product or at least you know could even change the spec that you'll receive and certainly like you said with apple and those kinds of folks there's more rules because they you know it's different. Well, and, the, it's and, the, small, and, and, and you know, bigger companies have have their own inspectors in the plants virtually all the time. So, right. and, and there are a lot of procedures in place for, for control. But that's not true of the the sourcing of the vast majority of products. So, uh, right. it it does pay to be prudent, and um, in many cases, it's not their fault because uh, they are under the gun to meet delivery deadlines from their customers 
in this country in Europe and other places and their suppliers have let them down so they've got to find a substitute just to make their delivery deadlines and so the it, it, the whole thing gets exacerbated and it's, I think it's going to be more so now because of the coronavirus because there are a lot of plants that are, are way behind and um, obviously as they're producing and catching up their their largest most favorite customers are going to get those parts first so smaller manufacturers you know may be at the back of the line unfortunately well and actually uh one of one of my uh, clients uh told me this um story recently about the coronavirus she said that the fact one of the factories that they use mm -hmm. you typically runs with three thousand people and they were in an area that wasn't shut down so they were feeling good about it until they realized that only 35 of the 3,000 people were actually working because they were waiting on the rest of the supply chain to uh, get permission to open so they could continue on. So what seemed like you know they had escaped a problem was actually a really bad problem. And, yeah, no question about it. Yeah. Well, also our our inspectors are are based in Hong Kong and then they cross over into Shenzhen and so on to do inspections. Well, they haven't been allowed to cross over at all, so they can't do the inspection. So the, the goods can't be released and payments not made until the inspection is complete. So there are lots of chickens and eggs that all have to get aligned. Right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a further problem in that the, there's now a shortage of containers in China because the flow has been disrupted. So that's got to catch up. And then, you know, as they start catching up, we will probably have a backlog at ports in the United States because of the, you know, all of the stuff coming in at once. And it'll take time to get back to normal. Yeah. I don't remember if you remember the uh, uh, Teamsters strike or the Longshoremen strike about ten years ago. It took three or four months for after it was settled for the flow of goods to kind of be back to semi-normal again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, I I know that there was a lot of chaos surrounding the uh, ports the last for the last strike. And to your point, it all you know it, that's the point of a supply chain, and especially an extended supply chain like this, is every you have even though you think you have an extended supply chain because you have a company in china producing for you you know now we're seeing the effects because they're dependent on other other folks for materials which are probably in china as well and then there's the ocean freight so everything gets backed up and then it becomes a big yeah. problem. we've we've had a number of our clients say well gee can you start finding us suppliers in other countries because we shouldn't be solely dependent on china right. well that's that's unfortunately it's easier said than done now for for low value high labor content goods like like um, the apparel industry and other soft goods businesses it's relatively easy to move sewing machines and and uh, find labor that can do relatively low level work but for more complex products high value products with expensive tooling or just hard to you know manufacture things because of the technical complexity it's it it is growing in other countries. I mean, we're seeing much more development in, in Vietnam and Malaysia, Indonesia, but it's still a long way off. And we've tried to find sources for some of our, our uh, clients that are in the electronics business, and it, there just isn't a big OEM infrastructure in, in a lot of these other countries as yet. Now, this the coronavirus and the high tariffs are probably going to trigger more of that, but I think it's going to take some time. Yeah, and that actually, I have a couple of questions to ask you here from other from folks, but I uh, that triggers something in my mind. I had another client who was sourcing most, you know, the vast majority from China. They have a they have a facility they own in Mexico as well, but it was the smaller of the um, uh, volume, if you will. Um, and so they proactively pre tariffs decided to look at Vietnam for cost reasons. Now, to your point, it depends on the industry. In their case, they were able to find good sourcing in Vietnam, and they started that transition. So now they are now they're looking like um, brilliant in a way because they, although they had experienced the tariffs last year, because you know it takes time, like you said, all this takes time. But they were in transition process. So like this year, they're going to save millions of dollars by avoiding the tariffs. And now the coronavirus um, has further complicated matters. So they're they're um, gonna um, look like even bigger heroes. Of course, you know, the coronavirus could get to Vietnam and, you know, different right, things. Right. But um, having a proactive approach to this is paying off for them. So that's, you know, that's a really good, um, 
example, I think. Well, it's, all, it's also, you know, the, the ongoing debates about onshoring and whether or not we're going to do a lot more manufacturing in the United States. And I think for, for certainly for smaller production runs and high value products, that is certainly possible if you can find the qualified labor to manufacture the products. There, right. there, there's something like 600,000 jobs available in Southern California going wanting because there aren't people skilled enough to operate you know, CNC machines and all, all sorts of other things. So it's a, it, that's a, a real challenge. I think if, if we had the infrastructure and the properly trained employees here, we'd be doing a lot more of it here. Right, right. I think that's very true. I am seeing people more and more starting to look at coming back to the U.S. and to Mexico um, for multiple reasons. One being that the China quality is not, shall we say, reliable unless you invest a lot more money than you expected into making sure that it stays reliable. So you really can't afford to just make an assumption and leave it alone. So there, it depends on the industry. It depends on if they're commodity based, but I'm seeing the right. move back because one, the quality two, the even bigger, much bigger is the Amazon effect. Everybody wants everything now. And of course you're, you mm -hmm. have a lead time with China, yeah. like typically two to three months is what most people have. And there's a lot of cash and, um, customer changing their mind and obsolete inventory built into all of that um, time frame. So I'm seeing that as well, but I think with the coronavirus, to your point, and um, you know the tariffs, it's going to um, encourage more people to move back. However, to your point, it's, it's creating a vast need for skilled, skilled uh, manufacturing professionals and then that leads back to the topic of automation and um, you know, trying to uh, you know, utilize more technology and automation so that we don't have to have as many people. Um, but we still, you know, it's, it's basically growing. We're seeing, starting to see a um, manufacturing growth, especially in the Inland Empire. Right. Yeah. Actually, I was just at the state of the manufacturing conference last night and let's look at my, my schedule here so I can give you the exact figures, but for the U S last year, let's see if I can find it. Maybe it's this way. Uh, for the U.S. last year, there was a um, two, the manufacturing job gain. Now, job gain is very different in manufacturing because it's related to um, people. And if as you automate, you don't need as many people, right? So, right, right. It's productivity. With that said, though, the uh, the U.S. was at um, thirteen percent um, job gain, and uh, California was at seven percent, which is really awful because California should lead the nation. Um, but it's obviously less attractive to manufacturers, but the Inland Empire, which is what this webinar is related to, so Jim, you'll have to hang with, hang with us here as we say this, but the Inland Empire grew at 21% versus the, the U.S. at 13. So, you know, we're, That's yeah. it's awesome, right? And the reason yeah, is, is that we are less expensive in the Inland Empire than a lot of the surrounding areas, but we, there's so many, lead time is such a big deal here. If we were by such vast population and, um, you know, and other manufacturers like aerospace are clustered that if, you know, being located close to your customer is, is um, um, important. So anyway, so I, I just throw that out there because it relates, but I do think you're right that we're going to see a surge and then there's definitely. Yeah, but I, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of it's going to come in California because our, our, our regulations are so tough and the cost of real estate now has just gotten to be astronomical, even in the Inland, Inland Empire that used to be, no. you know, really cheap. It's now much more expensive. I, I think that's very true. So it's, it's certainly, it's a whole other webinar topic, but that is the topic of um, a Brookings study, which is a think tank out of DC. They came and looked at the Inland Empire. And the conclusion is, is that with the automation and it's more in logistics even than in manufacturing because manufacturing has been automating all along. Um, and so there's less job concerns about it. I mean, there's still job concerns, but in logistics, there's vast opportunity to automate and there's a lot of logistics in the Inland Empire as well as manufacturing. So Brookings did a study saying, if you did nothing, you could have a disaster pretty much um, in terms of jobs. <laughs> and our strengths are manufacturing and distribution, which is, not particularly attractive to California lawmakers, if you will. So uh, the Brookings uh, study said, you better own this and um, you know, find a way to become like the experts in 
technology automation, how to make things yeah, environmentally yeah. friendly. And um, so there's a consortium effort. And actually, uh, Governor Newsom is um, is behind this happening. So I think we have a unique opportunity in this in Southern California and specifically the Inland Empire to bring folks back. Uh, and that's what they were saying last night, too. But anyway, to your point, Jim, uh, in the meantime, there's no way to get out of like China and just turn on a turn on a new source of supply quickly. <laughs> so you have to do no, something to continue not. to manage it. So, um, um, so I, oh, go ahead, Jim, did you have something to say? And then I'll ask you some of these questions. No, no, please, please go ahead with the questions. Okay, so um, unfortunately, I'm not sure what they're talking about here, but absolutely a valid concern. But for people without experience, please be sure to advise that when buying existing products, like stock parts, with a history of supply may have less concerns with potential quality concerns. Uh, yes, over time as a manufacturer, they will also look to cut costs and will do, and will do, uh, will do so with forgiveness instead of permission mentality. Well, that's what you were saying, Jim. Yeah, that's then, true. Uh, U.S. Customs has already contacted Vietnam about allowing China manufacturing to just ship through their country to avoid 25% tariff. <laughs> The huge increase of new product sales that did not exist before that this tariff are red flags. Um, well, I, I think they're pretty, pretty severe penalties for the importer, for the U.S. company that buys a product that comes through another country from China. Yeah. That the, the, the customs will, will find the U.S. buyer, not just the shipper. Right. I, I agree. I think that you're right, that people are trying to get around the tariffs, but mm -hmm. it's the U.S. is, um, you know, they're going to, I, I don't think you're going to have a long-term success with that. That's like one of those, like, you know, hits you over the head and you, and you demand somebody to do what they should do. That'll work for a small period of time, but it's not going to work long-term. So I think that's um, absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And let's see, we have, um, Unfortunately, the person who asked what report is that, what source, I'm not sure what report you were talking about. If you could tell me more about it, because we probably were talking about it and we carried on, and I don't know, unless you know, Jim, what report. Uh, well, for example, one of the, one of the things we, we require are CAPAs, or corrective action plans, for all the defects that we find when we're doing inspections. And so we take photographs of whatever the defect is and, and plus all of the technical measurements or you know, test reports, and then ask the factories for the plans they have to prevent the same kind of recurrence. And that's probably the most effective thing you can do to get them to change. The other thing we do is do a lot of statistical analyses so that often you see the same defect that is repeated over and over again for whatever reason. And so the more data you can gather um, to be able to point to trends and whether or not it's getting better or worse and so on, uh, also really seems to help in the process. Okay, that's no, that's good to good to know. And then, by the way, uh, Jim, who was writing the other e the other email that we were that I was reading earlier, just agreed with uh, us, Jim. And he said that uh, U.S. custom algorithms are finding these ship throughs, and so the fines are definitely not worth it. Um, yeah. Which is what I would I would definitely agree because they will find out and it's just gonna basically it's gonna add even more cost to your product as well as other <laughs> other problems. Yeah. Um, well, and then you you also become a red flag for you know future shipments. Oh, okay. So the the other person mentioned the report that he was talking about. He said the report was about the coronavirus and the decrease in production. So he wanted to know. Oh, oh yeah. Um, the the. I'm trying to remember exactly where I got this report the other day, but it, it, it indicated by city the, the uh, degree that production was back to normal. And it ranged, this was, this was as of the end of last week, and it ranged from 30 of uh, the city's furthest away, you know, from the, the uh, real epicenter. Uh -huh. And uh, they, they also indicated the percent, the drayage was back to normal, which is obviously an important issue because you got to get product from the factory to the port. And in, in almost every case, it was um, maybe 60% of, of 
but the manufacturing world, the drainage was maybe at 30% of normal. So that's, that's an, a, another problem to, to deal with. Right. Uh, you've got to be able to get containers into and out of these factories. And if the drivers are not allowed to, to move around in China, then you may be manufacturing things, but unable to ship them. So uh, everything has got to get back to normal. Now, the, this report also said they thought that it would get at, at least an order of magnitude better each week. So I don't know what that order of magnitude is, but, um, I, and I think it will probably be several weeks before things are back to normal production and drainage, and, and uh, maybe even longer in some areas. But, um, yeah. and, I, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact source of the, the, the data, but I, I found it very interesting. If I if I find the report, I can I can forward it to you, Lisa, and maybe you can send yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy ours. to do that. That'd be great. And by the way, since since this is an Apex and Lone Empire webinar, you know, I'll bring up that um, one of our own is actually supplying China with um, uh, safety equipment to fight the coronavirus. Uh, Roy Paulson from Paulson Manufacturing, who's been on our panels before, was written up in the L.A. Times, and you know, if Jim sends me the article, I'll also send this one out. But it was written up in the LA Times, so they got a $2 million contract to supply, um, you know, masks, because that's what they do, uh, yeah. to uh, yeah. help fight this uh, um, virus. And I was talking to him last night at this event, and he said that he's gotten, like, way more orders than he could possibly do, to your point. <laughs> Not just in China, but other countries. And so he's having to, like, um, prioritize who it is that he's turned away millions of dollars of business already because he doesn't want to promise things that won't happen which you know perhaps right. in china would be the opposite but he doesn't yeah, believe in that that's right. <laughs> so yeah. he's uh he's um like prioritizing who he'll send things to so you know there's something to be said about being a decent customer as well especially when you need when you need a source of supply <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. so um okay let's see now i have more people sending notes okay so let's see so what um uh, Jim was saying too, the other Jim who seems to be um, familiar with this topic, he said that her, his factories are saying that some of their employees are not coming back for various reasons. They were supposed to have opened on February 4th after the CNY, uh, but they were, but it was delayed. Because, it froze then. Yeah, so they were delayed to the 10th and the 17th, and then office employees were first, but factory employees are still trickling back, and they're 60% back now. Um, and next shipping is February 24th. So it seems like to your point there, you know, it'll ramp up, but slowly and it, you're dependent on your suppliers and where they are. Yeah. Well, it was also, you know, it was uh, unfortunate that it happened right mm -hmm. after the Chinese New Year. So they were shut down for a long time, started up and shut down again. And, and those, those cycles obviously can't help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I have to uh, throw it out there and Jim brought this up earlier, mm -hmm. but I think proactively looking for backup supply and not just when emergencies occur like this is very important. Like when I was a vice president of operations and supply chain, a director of procurement that worked for me, we had to fight with private equity backers um, to keep a higher cost supplier to a key material uh, on the East Coast because we had a source in Brazil. But it was related because what happened is there was a support strike and we couldn't get the supply from Brazil. And we were able to turn it on immediately without a problem. It would have been an utter disaster in terms of customer service because no one could care less yeah. if we had a problem. But we were able to do that um, only because not only do we just have a backup supplier, but we used the backup supplier continuously, which is why they would turn production back on, which means we were continually paying more money than we had to, which is why I had to fight with the board all the time. But it turned out to be a brilliant decision. So, but it's you know it's not a it's not a cost-free endeavor, but it certainly will be. My guess is is that in the end, your return on investment will be way higher if you make prudent decisions. But Jim, I would defer to you because you're related to this. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I I definitely think you should do that, and even even reflect the your standard cost to be a blend of those two different costs, so that. You don't get surprises either way. 
Very good. Um, now, uh, one other thing that um, he says is that the factories never came back from uh, Chu before the virus outbreak. So there's no cycle of open and close, uh, is what, is what the, one of our attendees said in his case. Um, now, another attendee is asking, for smaller manufacturers who are not able to visit the factories for frequent quality monitoring, how would you find agents overseas who can be trusted to visit the sites on your behalf? Well, Jim, I think you'd be perfectly suited to answer this question. <laughs> yes, they, they, the, the company like ours, you know, they're, I, I don't, uh, and T-Link is a sourcing and quality control company that uh, does services for U.S. manufacturers in China. And, and we're certainly not alone. In fact, the, there are some gigantic firms that do the same things, that have representatives in every city. We are relatively small, but um, I like to think we're different because the analysis. There are inspection firms and there are quality control firms that uh, many of which uh, have offices in the U.S. that you can contact to, to be your representatives on the ground there. Um, and, it's, and it's important to have uh, really good bilingual capabilities because you want to be able to communicate with them, but you also want them to be able to really understand what's going on in the factories. And, um, and, and so it's just a, it's a, it's a matter of gaining trust on all sides. Yeah, that, that is really important. I would, I would highly recommend that you consider like Jim's company or like Jim said, there's other options out there, but unless you have, unless you're significant of size and you have, you have people going over there constantly and monitoring, you know, you're able to have somebody monitoring quality that you can trust. Because remember, in China, you may get back whatever it is that they want you to get back, not, um, not uh, what's really going on. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it is surprisingly inexpensive to do it because of the labor costs, even of, of skilled people in China, are substantially less. So. Uh, I can't give you an exact price for every job, but it's probably a, a, a typical day of inspection work is under $300 in China. So if you're talking about a, a, a shipment of, you know, thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars to spend $250 or $300 to, to assure its quality is a pretty small price to pay. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> the cost, sorry, the cost of doing business, really. <laughs> you yeah. have to build that into your total cost before you decide to make these sourcing decisions. Definitely. Um, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and like what you're saying, Jim, is, is that, um, you know, if you have your backup supply and all your backup suppliers are also in the same country, it's, right now it's China, but it doesn't really matter what country we're talking about. Um, if, if they're all in the same country or all in the same, like, I don't know, area that could have the same types of issues, because this is just the coronavirus is just the latest thing. But there's right. political pressures. There's like uh, the um, China seas. There's uh, various, you know, ports that that are problematic. So you know, you sh you you have to pay attention to a lot more things. It's not just as simple as saying, you know, this is a good cost thing. I'm going to do it. Absolutely. So um, let's see now. So it sounds like a, what you would recommend. Uh, in generally speaking, when we set up this webinar, we didn't know about the coronavirus. So you're, you're saying, um, you know, as far as regardless, proactively managing quality in China is essential. You have to have feet on the ground to really know what's happening. And I can tell you from the international business attorney that, that trains the judges over there and, and that goes, you know, is very familiar that you, you really cannot just rely upon um, somebody that isn't, um, that you're not, they don't know really well. <laughs> And That's somebody right. like like you are, Jim, where you're you're not dependent on China. Like if somebody is working in in China, like basically what this international business attorney told me is, they are not allowed to tell you certain things. So if you have a great relationship with them, they'll find a way to like communicate, sort of without communicating the information. But right. they are not allowed to tell you. So uh, you you really need somebody like you who's out outside of that and can say the truth. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, absolutely that's true. And, and uh, there's nothing like creating relationships. Now, now the, at the same time, you've got to be careful of some 
um, local inspectors that live and work exclusively in, in an area can often become um, beholden in one way or another to the yeah. manufacturer. Um, I, I'm not saying that there definitely is bribery taking place, but they get pretty cozy one way or another. And so you have to make sure that you have objective sources too that can go in and, and, and work with these factories. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely essential. Um, so we're talking about having out, an outside viewpoint, really one that's not gonna be beholden to um, doing what, whatever it is that China tells them they must do. Um, right, exactly. At least, you know, having somebody that can sift through that for you. And mm -hmm. um, you need to um, have consistent and, um, like you said, every production run, sounds like, uh, at least some sort of data and uh, frequent monitoring. And I have to say, the other thing that uh, this international business attorney brought up in December, and I don't, I don't, or I should say he brought it up that it happened in December, uh, is, is that there's a new data protection law in China that went into effect in December. And in essence, now it says anything you send o through a server that goes to some, through a server in China, which is pretty much everything, yeah. can be seen by the, by the government. And by the government. it's yeah. just legal. So you, you also <laughs> now maybe need to mail things, but I don't know, uh, Jim, what are you? Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't heard about that. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that is the case. So it's, you know, if you're dealing with a product that, you know, doesn't really matter if someone sees your, if you have secret recipes, you know, intellectual property you don't want shared or seen, um, trade secrets, by all means, he suggested you do not send them in an email because they will be seen. Yeah, they, they, that's, that's kind of frightening. Isn't it's it? horrifying, right? Yeah. <laughs> they actually suggested that mail was a good option again. <laughs> One one other thing, that, and and I and this is slightly back to the earlier subject, but um, a, Chinese factories in general don't give any kind of warranties, so that it's up to you to once you bought the product, you own it and you're responsible for it. Now, now for a U.S. manufacturer, we almost always give warranties on our products, but it's it, but the burden is almost entirely on us now. You can write contracts that have catastrophic failure provision. So if if more than X percent of whatever the production run is fails, that you can charge them back or do all sorts of other things. But those provisions are only as good as the factory and how important your business is to them. And that um, clearly you 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 would like to get to be in a position where you're very important to a particular factory. Um, then you have some leverage. Otherwise, if something goes wrong, it's almost entirely on you. That's a really um, good point, because like I know some clients that have multiple factories, because it kind of spreads the risk, but it also means that you're a nobody. That's you're yeah, right? exactly. That's the problem. So you're 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 you know you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So it's yeah, very, that's very true. I mean, yeah. it's not to say you shouldn't. Uh, you know, there's always good reasons to source in certain places. I think that. I think that one of the conclusions here is is that you should be rethinking how you're sourcing. And if you are sourcing in certain countries like China, it may make perfect sense, but you need to have built in the appropriate quality processes and resources to help you with that. And then certainly having a backup, backup supply that really means more than a backup because they actually have to perform when you need them to. Right. And in some cases, that's just, it's it's not possible because of the cost of tooling or some technology that a Chinese factory may have exclusively. So uh, at times you have to take that risk. And um, you know, so I mean, there there are a lot of U.S. importers today that are going to be out of product very shortly. Right. And it's just lucky it's not the Christmas season. But even so, there are going to probably be many more shortages in the, in the next several months than we've seen in a long time. That is, that's very true. And actually it comes on the heels of um, Chinese New Year, right? So it's, um, yeah. yeah, the combination. It's really hard to predict. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, it was really a timely topic. Uh, so with that said, Jim, is there, if anyone else has any questions, please send them in. And are you, are, are you thinking like, what would be like a summary of highlights of things that, you know, given the situation today that you would recommend for folks to do? Because we obviously are where we are. Um, they should probably pursue. It's it's never too late to like at least rethink what you're doing. 
but uh, do you have any thoughts? I, I think the, the, the number one thing is just to, is to have people in the factories on a, on a very regular basis monitoring quality and, and practices and seeing what's going on uh, because it can change from, from production run to production run. So feet right. on the ground is the answer. Feet on the ground, yeah, that's very yeah. true. And then making sure you know what you <laughs> that who your feet on the ground are really reporting to. And like Jim said, even even folks that are good, if they're if they're focused on one region, I can you know they might become um, you know uh, reluctant to provide the full picture as well, just because they yeah. you know they yeah. have to live there. And, and just have have very very clear. Um, you know, product specifications in terms of, in terms of the quality that you would expect, and um, it, you know, ideally as much in writing as you can possibly have that to to document things, because they can also be very literal in the way they interpret things. So the 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 closer the guidance you can give, the better. That's a really good point. So um, clarity of specs is a, is is also a big deal, and clarity of your quality um, expectations, I, I imagine as well. Um, you, you have to spend a lot more time on that, I would think, to make sure it's- uh, Yes, and, and, and also you have to be reasonable. So in, in, in uh, virtually all of our cases, we specify what catastrophic defects are gonna be, but then also classify major defects and minor defects. And in a, in a given sampling, as you say we've sampled 150 parts and there can be two major defects and four minor defects and not reject the run or, or require 100% quality control. So, uh, so you just need to be fair and reasonable because nobody's going to be 100% perfect unless you're you're dealing with medical devices or something else that is absolutely critical that it's 100% you know, right. quality control. That's a, that's a really good point because you're also talking about um, people at this point that ha get to choose who they run for right now. <laughs> when they come back, right. they're going to yeah. choose who they run for. And are you a... Are you a customer that they want to have? I mean, this is similar to transportation when, you know, everyone, every carrier could get any load they wanted uh, a year or so ago. You know, they choose their customers and that right. is what's happening now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very any good. other questions? Uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So, um, uh, Jim, how would folks reach you if they wanted to uh, talk with you? Um, well, they can they can reach me by email. Uh, it's just jim at twerdall.net, T-W-E-R-D-A-H-L dot N-E-T. And if they're interested in, in sourcing and quality control in China, our website is tlinkhk.com, T-L-I-N-K-H-K.com. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So, so um, keep in touch with Jim. We will, uh, if, when Jim finds the article, we'll, we'll be happy to send out a link to the article that he mentioned, as well as the link to the uh, article of um, our Inland Empire company that's supplying the masks. Um, and, um, you know, we'll keep you, our goal will be to keep you uh, updated on uh, the latest uh, trends and watch outs in manufacturing and supply chain. So Jim, it was really timely today. So we really appreciate you. Uh, Thank you. Taking it was the time a pleasure to being with you. Yeah, very Thanks good. So well, well, we, we appreciate it. And I hope you have uh, a great um, rest of the week. And for the <laughs> rest of the attendees, please keep in mind that we have some classes starting soon uh, in uh, certified production inventory management, which is like, in essence, the fundamentals, um, a great education for a really low price, really. Um, we have courses starting in March for CPIM part one and part two. So take a look at our website, which is uh, basically APICS hyphen IE for Inland Empire dot org. And also we have our symposium coming up in April and um, we have some additional tours and uh, webinars coming up as well. So please, uh, you know, keep in touch with us and um, we, uh, we appreciate it, Jim. I hope you everyone has a rest, great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.